Uh, so hi everyone, welcome to the Toronto Data Workshop. Uh, this week uh, we have Josh Spiegel. Josh is jointly um, appointed across astronomy and also statistics. So he's the Banting and the Dunlop postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto. Uh, and he uses astrophysics and data science to understand how galaxies like our own Milky Way form, behave and evolve. Uh, Josh is going to speak and then Gwen is going to speak. And so Gwen is also a, um, Gwen's an assistant professor um, appointed between statistics and, and astronomy as well. Uh, so we'll have Josh, then Gwen's going to discuss and then we'll turn it over to general Q&A. Gwen, did you want to say anything else in, in introduction? Um, no, I, I think I think uh, you covered most of it. Um, I'm just excited to hear you know, about what Josh is doing. He's always uh, doing many projects at the at the same time. He's working with lots of great students and, and other postdocs as well. So yeah, just looking forward to it. Thanks very much, Josh. All right, then I will, uh, let me share my screen and uh, let's, can everyone see that? Perfect. All right. Well, yeah, it's, it's super exciting to get a chance to, to be here today. Uh, and I want to thank Rohan and all the organizers for the invitation. So uh, what I'll be trying to talk about is kind of the fun ways that, that uh, I find that sort of data science uh, intersects with astronomy and lots of my work, um, which is looking at sort of everything, stars, galaxies, and everything in between, which I like is both as like an in-joke to myself, because uh, I sort of like to study things in between the two scales, but also because I also study a lot of stuff that's actually in between like stars and galaxies, uh, like dust. Um, so, and, and I'll talk a little bit about, about some of that today. Um, and I want to focus on, for at least here, kind of the motivation behind some of this, and then also how lots of the problems in large data sets, uh, you know, have been super fun in, uh, in driving a lot of the research I do, and hopefully give, you know, try and, and see what ideas, suggestions, or, or things that all of you are thinking about in terms of how this can connect to, to work that you might be doing. So the big questions that I think about kind of are, are twofold. Uh, the first is I'm really interested in understanding how galaxies kind of as a, as a group form, behave, and evolve. Um, galaxies being these big collections of stars. And then the second thing is I'm curious how our own galaxy, the Milky Way, kind of fits into that picture. Um, you know, the same way we want to kind of study broader society, but we also want to contextualize kind of how you know, an individual fits into that, that context or a given, you know, smaller group. Uh, I think they're, they're pretty cool from a physics perspective. So galaxies are just really complicated, which makes them really fun to study. Uh, there are places where lots of different scales in physics interact. So in particular, this image on the right here, which I'm spotlighting, uh, all of these different snapshots are taken from this, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, and which you can see in every single one of these pictures are just tons and tons of galaxies. And you can just see there are bunches of different shapes, sizes, colors, uh, and all of that indicates just an incredible diversity of what galaxies do, what they look like, and how they behave. Um, and that's partly because there's a lot of stuff that goes into them. So there's stars, dust, gas, dark matter, black holes, you know, everything else. And it also encompasses all these various physics that, that go across tons of different scales. Um, from like the small scales such as star formation to like larger galactic scales where two galaxies merge. To, to things such as outflows, which couple sort of small things like black holes and large scale physics such as jets, which you know uh, can, can heat the entire galaxy all at once. Um, and so this has one main consequence, which is that because there's so much diversity of galaxies, you need like a large population in order to really understand a lot of what's happening. Um, so you have a diverse group, you need a lot of, uh, a lot of individuals, you can really capture the diversity. Uh, and that means you have to go big data. Um, which is sort of the first intersection with data science. Uh, and in astronomy, this has been great because in lots of other fields, right, like a lot of advances in technology have enabled us to really collect data on like a huge number of sources. And that's important for a couple of reasons. Like the hand wavy argument is that in the past, when we're looking at smaller populations, we can come up with very, you know, fundamental physics and learn things, but we're really telling general stories. Um, and today, we're kind of in this regime where a lot of studies are now looking at, you know, 10 million, 100 million or more objects using large surveys, such as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey from the Gaia Space Satellite. Um, and they're now trying to piece together lots of the details of what happens. 
Um, in the future, there are all these surveys that are ongoing. Uh, since I'm at UT, I picked to highlight like a bunch of initiatives that are at UT, such as SDSS5 and DESI and CHIME, which UT is a part of, um, all of which are just trying to survey the sky and really like take us from, you know, just uh, say millions of objects into the billions and soon to be hundreds of billions of objects uh, and not just observed like a single time, but actually capture time domain data um, across you know, the sky, say over every couple of days or, or several hours. Um, and that opens up a whole new regime for, for doing science. Um, so that also brings up the second point, which is we have these humongous data sets, which we need to study galaxies. And studying them also requires that we integrate these data sets together, since all these different physics are actually observable in different parts and with different techniques. Um, so I like to call this the data apocalypse, uh, which is that for you know a bunch of these sources, you know we now are in a regime in astronomy where essentially all of the sky has been covered with various surveys and different types of data, um, all of which are at different wavelengths and are of different types, um, and these also encompass very different structures from things like photometry, which I'll talk about in a second, the spectroscopy, time series data, intensity data. Um, et cetera. And the question that I'm always concerned with is how am I going to take this hodgepodge of stuff and integrate them together and get out some really exciting science? Because all of these tell us different things and together they can do more than kind of what each of them can do individually. So I'm very interested in all these methods to try and combine these different data sets together uh, and to sort of a unified picture. Um, this is important because they do actually complement each other, both in terms of like different uh, structure, but even at the same wavelength, you can learn things. So if we want to observe a galaxy, uh, then we can go to our telescope. And this is uh, the uh, Mayall down in Arizona, uh, which is running DESI. And we want to figure out what, what's going on. Um, and the easiest thing we can do is go get a spectrum. This is essentially measuring the brightness as an intensity, uh, as a function of wavelength. And all of the individual features you see here on the bottom, this is all signal. Um, so every single one of these, you know, huge peaks here, these are all specific atomic, atomic or molecular lines. Um, and you can see some of these absorption features that are indicated as well. So this also tells us something about how the galaxy, you know, has grown over time. Um, but this is really slow, uh, it's detailed, and it's quite costly. Um, what's much cheaper is you can take a nice big slab of glass uh, with a little filter on it, you stick it in front of your telescope, and you take a picture. Uh, and boom, you get a nice picture of your galaxy in, in a particular wavelength. Um, and that's equivalent to essentially doing this. So you have some response function and you've integrated essentially your, your spectrum through this filter. You just measure the mean intensity. Uh, you can do this for a bunch of different types of filters. And this is called photometry uh, or taking a picture. This is crude, fast, and cheap. This is like what you do with your, you know, your camera and your iPhone does this in you know, three different color, uh, color bands. Um, and so boom, you stick a bunch of different slabs of glass in front of your, uh, you know, your telescope and you have a really coarse data set. So you have this really beautiful data and now you have this really terrible data. Um, but, you, but the thing about it is that this terrible data, which we call a spectral energy distribution, this five point you know, data set, uh, we can get that to a lot more galaxies than the former. So in fact, often we're dealing with orders of magnitudes more objects. And so the question is, we have sort of this very crude picture of lots of what's going on from these different imaging surveys from photometry. And for a small fraction, a very biased fraction, we have this very high quality data. Um, and the question is, they're looking at the same thing, but in two very different ways. So how can we actually combine these different data sets together? And I'll sort of show that in, in the talk that there are some, some fun ways that we can do that. So that's the idea. Uh, and so fundamentally, like I'm very interested in, in learning about how the Milky Way kind of, uh, at least the artist conception on the right connects with sort of galaxy evolution on the left. And so there are some ways that we can sort of say, you know, to understand galaxies, we need to go bigger, we need to think about large scale structure in cosmology. And then to understand the Milky Way, we need to go smaller, we gotta understand stars um, and how they form. And of course, we can also try to understand, you know, these dynamics about how galaxies evolve. So my research kind of tries to encompass all of these things. And again, like focusing on the use of these large data sets to tease out various stuff. So kind of here, hopefully this sets up the motivation for why I think this is fun. Um, and you know, what I want to just do for like the data workshop is talk a lot about sort of the, the different data and motivation uh, in like a couple of different domains, just to highlight some of the, the fun connections I think that we can make. So I want to start on the big side and I'll kind of work my way down to, to even smaller. 
So one of the fun things about cosmologies uh, or problem in astronomy in general is that we don't know the distances to things. Um, and one solution that we have is because uh, we have this image, you know, we don't know, no star comes with a little label that says, hey, how far away am I? Um, but what we do have is all these images of stars, this photometry, and this very high quality data, the spectroscopy. And so naturally people think, why can't we use machine learning to connect these two data sets together? This high quality data, this low quality data, and do some type of label transfer. The problem is that often the goals of sort of standard machine learning tools in industry versus astronomy are a little different. Um, often in industry, you're working with data that don't have sort of known measurement uncertainties. So they might, you know, you might have them implicitly, but you don't know them explicitly. Um, in astronomy, we often do. Uh, we often are dealing with missing data. A lot of times we have data that's censored for various reasons. Um, that's often a big problem. Uh, we have data that's incomplete. We know sort of what that incompleteness is to some extent, but we need to come up with a way to model that. Um, we don't have data that's homogeneously collected. As I said, we have data from all these overlapping surveys. So this is a big challenge. Everyone has done their own sort of you know, niche application. We need to figure out how to combine those. And so I think like a fun counterexample, this is all straw man, right? Obviously for, for you know, detailed machine learning, you always care about these things. But the straw man example is MNIST, um, where you have this very homogenous data set, you're just trying to figure out, you, know, you put a machine learning algorithm on this, you wanna train some convolutional network to figure out you know, what is this image. And then you assign some probability to your digits and then boom, you get, you get some answer, um, right? Which brings up, Final thing, which is that there's no other option. In astronomy, we often care about like the fact that we might see some really weird or peculiar objects, and we want to make sure that we flag those when they come up, right? We have data that's very out of distribution. Um, so if we see something like this, uh, a standard algorithm will just generate a prediction like nothing is wrong, and we really want to have some flags to say, is this actually you know, what we expect? Is this data weird? If so, how? Um, and that's because in astronomy, when we're trying to generate predictions, we care about going to sort of, you know, the outskirts of what we're looking to, to objects that are way out here. You want to figure out how to characterize them. Um, we're always looking to go further and deeper uh, and do new and exciting things. And so astronomers are very guilty of taking machine learning methods and trying to apply them as much out of data as possible uh, of distribution uh, where, where we're kind of pushing the boundaries of where it should really be applied. Um, so we want to be able to understand these things too. So a lot of what, uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in is coming up with machine learning methods kind of tailored for the specific domain, you know, either physics informed or kind of statistically motivated. So not something that's off the shelf, but something that's kind of designed for, for the data in question. Um, and one fun example that, uh, that I got to work on was this project called FrankenZ, which is deriving essentially distances or redshifts as they're often known in astronomy um, to a bunch of galaxies from images uh, and the, the solution that I came up with was this really simple Bayesian you know, modification to a k-nearest neighbor's approach, which took into account uncertainties and priors and things like this. Um, and what we found is that when we sort of look at the plot here on the right, which is just showing, uh, whoops, um, essentially the, the difference between various methods, uh, what you can see is that just looking at uh, these different approaches, this green is kind of the traditional way of doing things, more accurate is lower on here, brighter to the left, uh, that the method that we came up with actually does just as well as deep learning approaches and actually does better um, on the brighter end where these systematic uncertainties and statistical uh, you know, things matter more. Um, this has changed since then. This was done a couple of years ago and deep learning methods have improved. Uh, at least their application here. But this was at least one, one cool example of how kind of approaching things from a bit more of a statistical perspective turned out to be helpful. Um, plus, one bonus that I, I can't highlight here is that the interpretations that we can come up with from this method were really interpretable. You know, we could always wind back every prediction and say exactly where they came from and, you know, what, what exactly we were doing. Um, and fundamentally, they're also probabilistic, um, which is a big plus. So everyone loves error bars. Uh, Another domain where, where we found that these types of data science methods can be really useful uh, is when looking at galaxy evolution. And one sort of central problem in galaxy evolution is understanding uh, a question that we all wish we understood, which is, uh, you know, how do galaxies grow up? Uh, I think a lot of, uh, I can speak for probably everybody who's, uh, who's a parent or thinking about being a parent that, uh, that you wish there was some rule book that described how, how these things work. Um, and you'd really like to, to have that, uh, you know, in your back pocket when deciding what to do. Uh, 
And it's the same is true for galaxy. We really like to understand how we go from like a small child galaxy, kind of like the, the larger galaxies we observe today. Um, and we really don't have a, a firm idea of how you go from one to the other. Um, that's changed a lot in the past uh, several decades, uh, primarily informed by observational data. So one of the things that we discovered was that there's this tight correlation between the star formation rate, the amount of stars that are being formed today, and the stellar mass, or essentially all the stars that have formed yesterday uh, that, you know, in a galaxy's past over time. And what, what I've shown here on the right is essentially a huge literature compilation I did a few years ago, just showing that the observational data were very consistent in giving this picture. Um, and so each of these different plots is showing essentially in the y-axis the amount of stars that are forming today. Um, and in the x-axis is time. And each of these different panels are for galaxies of a fixed mass. And you can see this really tight you know, linear correlation. And all the different you know, indicators here are for different types of observational studies. Um, and so this seemed to tell us this picture that galaxy assembly is not sort of random or chaotic. It definitely is something that's you know, driven by kind of central limit theorem uh, you know, concerns where a lot of these hierarchical growth ideas where we have lots of small galaxies that kind of merge into big galaxies and they're driven by kind of processes that are much more secular rather than much more chaotic really seem to dominate. The problem though is that, so I just said that I did this huge literature compilation, all these studies agree. Uh, the problem is if you just do one simple check, uh, it doesn't make sense, uh, which is you just do a quick check and you say, how many stars are forming today? That's sort of this, the density of stars, rho SFR. And you can just say, well, actually, I'm just going to go and check empirically, like how much mass was there at some time and how much mass is there at the different time. And I'll just take the difference between the two. So I'm just going to compute an empirical derivative. And you find that those estimates disagree by a factor of two. And both those estimates, I will say, were derived with the same data. Uh, and so this is not great. Right? Somehow there's this disagreement where we have this really great observational consistency, but yet we're physically inconsistent. This picture is impossible. Um, so what gives? And the answer turns out to really be rooted in kind of data science and statistics, uh, which is, could everybody be wrong and why? And the spoiler is yes. Uh, and the reason comes down to the fact that there are many pathways to go from, from A to B. Uh, there are many different ways for galaxies to grow up, just like there are many different ways for people to grow up. Um, some you know, assumptions that people have been making was that this growth was pretty smooth and you follow some deterministic path. Uh, but it turns out that there are some cases where these big mergers can kind of derail you, or you can kind of oscillate around some equilibrium solution, or you can get something a little bit more chaotic and stochastic. And all of these different solutions actually are possible and we're not being explored by lots of the methods that were used to, to try and model galaxies. Um, so the solution was to try and develop something that could. Uh, and this led to the motivation behind this, this code we developed called Prospector. Uh, and the idea behind Prospector was to really just take like a, a Bayesian view and try and marginalize over as much of these parameters and uncertainties as possible. So those are all kind of shown on the right. The parameters don't quite matter. It's just the fact that they all exist. There are tons of them. And so if you add in more data, you're then going to get some additional constraints. We wanted to, to try and capture a lot of this by marginalizing over the uncertainty. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that there are a lot of parameters involved. And so it turns out sometimes you get pretty ugly stuff. So this is a gigantic corner plot showing the 2D marginal and 1D marginal distributions of all of these parameters for a particular galaxy. And what I want to draw your attention to is what's happening on the bottom, where you see that there actually is a bimodal solution uh, for this particular uh, parameter in question, in this case, has to do with sort of the, the gas phase metallicity uh, or the gas phase chemical composition for, for this particular source. So this is a mess, right? It's not easy to infer. Um, and so this meant that we had to solve a statistical problem, uh, which was how do we infer sort of these broad uh, extended distributions? And this led me to do work on a uh, dynamic nested sampling method called Dynasty to try and solve this. And the way it works is kind of illustrated by a logo, which is you kind of sample from the outside in. Uh, and by doing so, you can kind of track some of these individual solutions as they emerge. There are pros and cons to every method over this, you know, compared to traditional methods like MCMC, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, but this worked out pretty well for us. And what this meant was that, you know, once we had this in hand, we could go apply this to data sets of about 120,000 galaxies and see if we could answer our question. 
uh, if we do things right, essentially a little bit more carefully, do we solve this problem? And so about 1.5 million CPU hours later, uh, we did have an answer and the answer was we did it. Uh, at least, so this doesn't say we're right, but it does say that our answers are now internally consistent. Um, and the fix come from two different sources. The first is that when you give more flexibility to galaxies, they, they follow that. Um, and so you get galaxies that are older, that have more extended star formation histories. And what that means is you get more mass um, build up over time. The second is that these older stars, they don't just kind of uh, fade off into the distance. Uh, like everyone's grandparents, they stick around and they, they want to contribute. And so what that means is that you get, uh, you know, essentially some of the things you see today turn out to be from those older stars and not from younger stars. And that means that the star formation you think is happening today actually is, is, uh, is not there. It's due to these older stars. So you get increase from the bottom, a decrease from the top, and that brings you into agreement. Um, on both of these axes. And this is only possible because we, we sort of tried to, to implement all of these different tools and apply them to sort of these large data sets to answer this question. So this is something that would not have been possible without sort of approaching this from, from sort of this perspective. The, the last things I want to focus on are kind of on the Milky Way itself um, and trying to see how we can use these large data sets to better understand our own galaxy. Um, and this kind of gets to the heart of a lot of what I do today. Uh, which is how do we actually construct what I think of as cosmic cartography, which is how do we go from, uh, to get a pretty picture like this, uh, from data like this, which is that we think, for example, over here in this nice picture, and when we look out at the sky, what we see is just stars, because um, we're in the galaxy, so we can't kind of fly out of the galaxy Star Trek style and like look down from the top and sketch a picture and come back. You know, the same way that for many, many years, right, up until, you know, the 70s, we had no idea what our planet looked like. You know, that's like a real revolution in the sense that we have, you know, we're very fortunate to be able to do that, to actually get some perspective on what the globe is. Um, prior to that, our efforts of cartography were fundamentally limited to the sort of this approach. We're trying to reconstruct the, the overall surface from just these sort of two things. So how do we go from left to right? This turns out again to be a challenge, uh, but one that is solvable. If we go around and look at a lot of stars, what we find is something shown on the right. So this is a plot showing the brightness of the stars on the y-axis uh, and the color of stars on the x-axis. So left is kind of bluer, right is redder. Um, and the density here is shown as these different colors. And what we find is that there's a correlation. Stars that are brighter tend to be bluer and stars that are fainter tend to be redder. Um, and this correlates a lot with how stars evolve. What this means is that if we see a star, say, you know, with a particular color and brightness, then we know that it, it must be at some distance uh, based on, you know, the inverse square law. When you move something further away, it gets a little dimmer. Uh, and so we can draw a little line and we can say, all right, well, it's intrinsic brightness or its true brightness has to be somewhere in this range. So that gives us some really crude measure of how far away it is. The problem is that, unfortunately, uh, as I referenced at the beginning of the talk, the universe isn't empty. Although it's pretty empty in lots of cases, but there's this stuff in between us and, and, uh, and the star, and that stuff is dust. And what dust does is it really confuses this view. Dust blocks the light, a process known as extinction, that makes it look fainter. The same way if you have like dust on your glasses or other things, it makes it kind of look a little dimmer. Um, but it also reddens the light because it, it scatters light more effectively at shorter wavelengths, which is bluer light than redder light. So because you're removing more blue light than red light, you get this effect where the thing looks redder. And that means that we can think, for example, in this extreme that we have two possible solutions that are consistent with the data. One is that the star is dim and red because it's actually dim and red and it's close by and it's this low mass cool star, or it's dim and red because it's actually blue and bright. It's just far away and there's a lot of dust in front of it. And we don't know what the right answer to these things are. And there's the additional problems, which come with the fact that you might notice there's this second solution way up here, uh, where a star with the same color is actually many, many times brighter. Uh, and this is the difference between a dwarf star and a giant star. So a dwarf is a star like our sun, uh, whereas a giant star is one like Betelgeuse, which is really expanded to become super massive, uh, really big, uh, you know, super large, and then also very, very bright. And these two stars can look exactly the same if you move them to different distances. So the upshot to all of this is that if you look at then try and estimate uncertainties 
for distances and sort of foreground amounts of dust for lots of different stars. Each of these panels is illustrating a particular probability distribution we estimate from a Bayesian code uh, for each of these stars. You can see that you get these ugly, gross distributions. Often they have multiple solutions again. So uh, it comes up again that this is just a hard problem. Uh, to try and solve this and to really apply this at scale, uh, we developed sort of a, a new, you know, different code. That's sort of a recurring theme as I like in the data science side, you kind of develop your tailored, you know, bespoke artisanal solutions, just like your favorite coffee shop. Uh, and, uh, and you apply it to sort of large scale processing. Um, and one of the great things is that we applied this to a data set of about 170 million objects. Um, and I'll show you kind of a fun visualization we came up with to try and, and see what's going on there. Um, so this is an interactive map that we call All Sky. This is based on sort of similar maps of, say, ocean currents or wind maps here on the Earth. So what you're seeing essentially um, is the selection of stars at some distance from the sun, in this case, about 7 to 11 kiloparsecs, or about 20 to 30 light years, uh, 1,000 light years away. Um, and these things are sort of like bulk motions. You can think of them like ocean currents of stellar motion. And if you click around, you can kind of see, you know, how stars are moving. And the coordinate system here is such that the center is the Milky Way, uh, the plane. And the reason that there's no data here is that we didn't fit it because uh, there was too much of it for sort of our, our initial starter uh, sample. And this is sort of like looking up and down out of the galaxy. So this plot, I feel like, is not super clear. So I always like looking at it, say, you know, on the surface of a sphere, which is what we're really doing. Um, and what's fun is that, you know, this is sort of our way of trying to visualize kind of 170 million stars and see what their properties are. And you can see, for example, fun structures here. These are known like globular clusters or associations of stars that are very far away. You can see general bulk motion for lots of things. Uh, you can switch the backgrounds. So you can kind of see how many stars we're modeling at various points. Um, this shows you, for example, like these little imprints are all the imprints of dust. If we go a little further out, you can see some fun examples. For, uh, for instance, down here, you might notice that there's this uh, weird structure that seems to be kind of flowing through the southern part of the sky. This is actually a dwarf galaxy known as Sagittarius that's actually merged with the Milky Way, and we're actually seeing sort of the stream of stars that it leaves across. Um, or you can, you know, zoom in to be super close to us, and you can sort of see the general flow of stars as they orbit in the, you know, disk of the Milky Way uh, around where we are. So this is all super fun, uh, and this is just our first attempt to visualize this data. Uh, where we really, like, my dream at least would be to actually have like a full 3D augmented reality thing where you can like swim and see all the stars. But this is at least, uh, I think, a fun way to to get started on it. So last thing I want to close sort of uh, with all of this is um, trying to use this to understand a little bit more about galactic structure uh, and star formation. So again, all of these are trying to take the same ideas of combining methods from data science with large data sets, statistics, machine learning, and see what we can do. Um, and one of the things that we can do once we have like this machinery in place is we can start to use stars to actually map out the interstellar medium, otherwise known as sort of dust and gas, interstellar dust and gas. So we have a telescope down here, and we're interested in looking at a picture of the sky. Um, there's a bunch of dust in the way. We don't know what the dust is, um, but what we do know is that we have some stars. And assuming that those stars kind of have these colors when they shine through the dust, uh, we're then going to see a modified version of their colors. So some of them will be redder than the others, will be a little dimmer, um, et cetera. And so this means that we can infer the distance and distribution of dust based on its effects on many different stars. And one of the views of this is shown here. Um, so this is the top-down view of the galaxy. The sun is at the center here, is in blue. Um, this is kind of the x direction. The y direction, the galactic center, is kind of like this way. Um, and each of the white sort of uh, background on this is a method that was developed by Greg Green for doing three-dimensional dust mapping using lots of stars. And each of the individual uh, orange circles is a star forming region that we were able to identify um, using sort of these techniques. So again, every single data point here is essentially estimated from tens of thousands of stars um, that we use to determine the distances to places where stars are being born. 
And what was really cool is that a lot of these things have been studied for you know over a hundred years in astronomy, and so they all have these names, and they're associated with constellations, and you can kind of see them labeled all over. Um, one thing we noticed once we were able to actually get distances to these things was like, uh, what is this? Like, there's this weird line of stuff that seems to line up like perpendicular to us, which is weird because most structures that we expect should be kind of radial. That's sort of the bias we have in astronomy is we're looking to something. So like something that's kind of randomly like perpendicular to that is something you did not expect. And it turns out we did some more modeling on this. Uh, we found this really cool structure, which, which we call the Radcliffe Wave in honor of the Radcliffe Institute where we discovered it. Um, and so this is kind of now highlighted in, uh, in light blue. And the panels on the right kind of show these different projections, either kind of end on or kind of like face on. And this wave that we found is, we don't really know where it comes from, but it appears to encompass a lot of these regions that have been studied for a long time. Uh, and what's really fun about this is that it turns out that this particular view uh, ended up overturning sort of this paradigm of how stars have formed around the sun that's been, you know, roughly present for about 150 years, uh, which goes back all the way to Benjamin Gould uh, and his name is a Gould belt from 1874. So this thing does not look like a ring. Uh, and so it was really cool to actually see like this is one instance where having all this, uh, you know, this data led to this very serendipitous kind of data-driven discovery. Um, so we're still trying to figure out what exactly this is and, and what it might be associated with, but it was, uh, it was definitely a, an unexpected and really fun surprise. So I want to end with just saying that, uh, as Ben mentioned, I collaborate with a lot of people and I want to give a lot of thanks to everybody who's helped to make us this stuff possible, uh, you know, in terms of the data, the methods, and also just being great. You can see Gwen here is featured as well, of course. Um, and then lots of the students who, uh, and postdocs uh, who I managed to work with at U of T uh, over, over the past year, year or two. So with that, I'll sort of leave here and just say, hopefully this has all been uh, a fun intro to lots of this. And uh, in particular, I'd like to emphasize that, you know, there are lots of open questions and way too much data. Um, and so I think that, that means that it's a lot of fun. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, that was incredible. Uh, I'm going to turn to Josh's supervisor, uh, Gwen. <laughs> Uh, for immediate uh, discussion, and then we'll take some. Then we'll take some questions. Uh, we won't record the questions, but Gwen, are you? We'll record your discussion, or sure. yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll so we'll stop recording once Gwen's done. Um, so Gwen, thanks. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Josh, so much for this really excellent talk. Um, super exciting. So I, I thought to start the discussion, I might. Um, take a step back and give like a, a bigger picture of the fields of astrostatistics and astroinformatics. So um, there, astrostatistics and astroinformatics have, they've been around for the past 20 years, but I think in the last like 10, five to 10 years, they've really picked up speed. Um, and there's groups both in the statistics community and in the astronomy community um, that, that work in this area. So for example, the American Statistical Association has an astrostatistics interest group and they run like an annual astrostatistics student paper competition and have regular sessions at JSM and so on. Um, and then in, uh, in the American Astronomical Society, there's also the working group in astrostatistics and astroinformatics. Um, and, and I think that one, one reason this field has grown so much is that um, you know, astronomy is starting to get a ton of data and um, there's also a very large variety of problems in astronomy and astronomers have to be pretty hyper specialized. So, um, you know, depending on what you work on, you might have to specialize in certain areas of physics. So maybe you study neutron stars. So then you'd really have to understand, you know, like um, quantum mechanics and, and some smaller scale things. Um, but if you study, you know, stars and galaxies, and their kinematics, and you have to know, you know, celestial mechanics, and um, so there's just a really, really big variety um, of expertise that is needed um, in astronomy. And and so, you know, as as astronomers go through, we go through our careers, we may not get the statistical training um, that that's needed because we spend so much time learning all this other stuff in physics. Um, and and I think traditionally there hasn't been a lot of statistics courses in, in, um, in physics programs and astronomy programs. Um, but now the community is realizing this and we have all this data and you know we want to do our data analysis properly and, and rigorously. 
Um, and we're learning now that there's all these other methods from statistics and, and data science and, um, that, that can be applied to these problems. Um, so I think that's one reason that it's really uh, taken, taken up speed in the last few years. Um, the, the, other, the other reason too, is that not only are these ups, do people have to specialize in certain areas of physics, um, they also have to specialize in certain types of data analysis. So as Josh mentioned in his talk, right, we have photometric data, which are like images. We have spectroscopic data that are, you know, spectra from stars. We could have time series data. Um, other types could be um, actually polarimetry data. So maybe you're measuring like the magnetism. So all these different kinds of data is like this other layer of, of complexity that we need to deal with. Um, so yeah, so with that, I thought like a, maybe a good um, first discussion question and, and you know, Josh or, or anyone else um, here is familiar in astrostatistics could, could chime in here. I was just wondering what you find is the, is the biggest challenge and or opportunity in, in this interdisciplinary collaboration um, in astrostats. Uh, so, I mean, we might, I'll stop recording just so that we're not putting people on the spot. Um, sure, yeah. I'm going to take a stab at 